question has been answered. And uh, we have spent 24 minutes on this question. We will move on to the next question now. Question for the Honorable John Kwok Chi. Thank you, President. The government announced in the 1999 budget the introduction of a competitive bidding system for the delivery of social self welfare services, with price and quality being the criteria for evaluation of bids. Subsequently, in 2001, the Social Welfare Department, or SWD, started granting time-limited contracts for contract homes and enhanced home and community care services, or EHCCS, for the elderly through competitive bidding. I've learned that a new bidding exercise will shortly be conducted for the EHCCS project, and subsequent to the failure of some service agencies in bidding for the new contracts, some users of such services have experienced difficulties in adapting to the services provided by new service agencies and their staff. Moreover, some service agencies have eased employing experienced staff whose salaries were relatively higher for the purpose of reducing costs so as to boost their chance of success in the bidding, resulting in deterioration of the service quality. In this connection, would the government inform this council one of the respective numbers of contracts for contract homes and EHCCS awarded to new service agencies through competitive bidding in each of the past 10 years? Two, whether it has considered incorporating provisions into the tender documents for EHCCS to the effect that the pay offered to the relevant staff by the successful bidders must be adjusted in line with the pay adjustment for civil servants each year. If it has of the details, if not the reasons for that, and three, as there are views that SWD's granting of time-limited contracts for EHCCS by competitive bidding will result in no morale among the frontline staff and aggravate the brain drain problem, whether the authorities will consider bringing such services within the ambit of the lump sum grant subvention system, if they will, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Labour and Welfare, point of order. What's your point of order? Speaker was off mic.
Secretary. President, my reply to the questions raised by the Honorable Chuan Kwok Chi is as follows. One, since 2001, the SWD has been selecting contract homes service operators through contract bidding. And service contracts have been awarded for the operation of 24 contract homes. In the past 10 years, two of the service operators of these contract homes have been changed. For the Enhanced Home and Community Care Services, or UHCCS, after its regularization in 2005, service contracts were also awarded to service operators through contract bidding. There's been no change in service operators for UHCCS as the government has extended contracts with service providers to continue the provision of services. Two and three. Given Hong Kong's aging population and the rapidly increasing number of elderly persons, the demand for home care services is very keen, and service places and service teams have increased accordingly. The aims of awarding service contracts through contract bidding are to enable the service providers to provide more flexible services for service quality enhancement and allow more operators which can meet the service quality requirements to take part in service provision. The government has set out clearly in EHCCS contracts the contract service fees for the whole contractual period so that bidders may carefully consider and estimate before bidding their income and expenditure for the contractual period and take this into account when preparing the tender to ensure continual provision of quality services. It is also expressly provided in the contracts that the contract service fees will be adjusted annually according to the Composite Consumer Price Index so that operators can cope with the increase in expenditure owing to inflation during the service period. Service operators may, based on individual circumstances, deploy resources flexibly to employ suitable staff to deliver services according to the contractual requirements to avoid limiting the service operator's flexibility in resource deployment, SWD has not included clauses on the level of staff remuneration in the service contracts. At the meeting of the electrical panel on welfare services on the 9th of June 2014, we listened to the views of the panel members and representatives from the social welfare sector on the funding mode for EHCCS. The sector expressed its wish to change the funding mode for DHCCS from the existing contractual bidding to annual subvention under the lump sum grant. This would represent a fundamental change. We will need time to consider and examine this carefully. The existing 24 server contracts, which involve a total of 5,579 service places, are due to expire in late February 2015. Moreover, to further enhance the support for frail elderly persons to age at home, we have secured resources to provide 1,500 new places from March 2015 onwards. There is thus an urgent need to decide before February 2015 on the service operators for those 7,079 service places. The welfare sector has already agreed that the contracts for the 1,500 new service places will be awarded through contract bidding. For the existing 5,579 service places, both the panel on welfare services and the sector hope that the government will consider extending the existing 24 contracts by administrative means to allow the existing service operators to continue their services for the elderly. We are actively exploring this proposal internally. Thank you. Mr. Zhang Kwok Chu. Thank you, President. Uh, the uh, Secretary said that the uh, bidding uh, mode has been in place for more than a decade. But with contract bidding, service operators are bound to change. Uh, given that services for the elderly and the disabled are people-oriented, this is not the right model. Luckily, the Secretary uh, has uh, said that he would very carefully consider uh, the change of the funding mode to annual subvention. We we'll look forward to a favorable reply. In period two of the Secretary's uh, reply, it said that the contract service will be adjusted annually according to the Composite Consumer Price Index. However, we know that 
the uh, salary adjustment of staff every year uh, is usually higher than uh, the uh, CCPI, Consumer Price Index. I'd like to ask whether the uh, adjustment mechanism can include annual staff pay adjustment in addition to the CCPI so that uh, staff would not only receive the minimum adjustment every year in pay. Secretary, well, in the past decade or so, we've been adopting CCPI as the basis for adjusting these contract fees with some justifications. Now, for subvent organizations, uh, under the lump sum grant, we will uh, follow uh, uh, we will enhance uh, the fees uh, for the uh, organizations following uh, that basis, though uh, the organizations are given a free hand to uh, decide how to deploy the resources. We believe at this stage, uh, using the CCPI as the major basis for adjustment is appropriate. The chairman, the secretary has misunderstood my point. I'm not talking about the lump sum grants, but contract bidding where only CCPI is considered. I hope that uh, the civil service pay adjustment uh, can also be included in the uh, fee adjustment for contract bidding contracts. Now, I'm s yes, I talked about uh, the arrangement for lump sum grant mechanism, but as we all know, we are now talking about a contract system uh, where a contract service fee is given to pay for the expenses. We believe uh, using CCPI is an appropriate approach. However, we don't rule out your suggestion. In the future review, we will consider uh, whether we can uh, include um, uh, increase the uh, factors to be considered. Mr. KK Fung, uh, under uh, contract bidding, we we'll only uh, go for the lowest bid. But I believe that this is not the right model for services for the elderly, because uh, in addition to the facilities, we we'll also have to look at a rapport between the elderly persons and the social workers and the carers, because uh, this is not just uh, giving them the basic needs, but uh, escort to uh, uh, follow-up consultation, uh, bathing, and so on and so forth. So uh, it takes time for uh, the carers and the elderly persons to develop uh, the right relationship. Although the secretary said in his reply that he would consider changing the funding mode, can we be given a more categoric reply? There will be another round of bidding early next year. I'd like to ask whether a decision can be made so that uh, come the end of this year or early next year, uh, the um, contract bidding mode can be changed, or at least can you extend the contracts for another three years so that you can buy time to conduct a review? Secretary, thank you, Mr. Chung, for your question and suggestion. We've discussed with the sector, uh, members of the Welfare Services Panel and HKCSS, we have very good, very, very good communication. Uh, we have at a meeting uh, with uh, the sector and the HKCSS and uh, last week, there was also a very frank dialogue at the WS panel. I'd like to stress that uh, we have our justifications and uh, policy basis for this review. We do understand uh, the sector's aspirations. For the new 1,500 new places, uh, there is no disagreement. Uh, there will still be a contract bidding. But for the existing 5,057 service places, we have to consider because we cannot turn them to a lump sum grant system overnight. There are policy considerations, and we also have to communicate with the uh, Financial Services and Treasury Bureau. We also have to consider our uh, planning a uh, scheme for elderly services that will be done in the coming two years. So our direction is to consider this very positively. And then uh, during the transition period, we'll, uh, we are minded to use contract renewal or extension. 
uh, so we hope uh, we can give certainty to the staff. This is a women's situation. We will have enough time to review our uh, situation and reposition and repositioning of such services. And meanwhile, uh, the uh, organ the uh, service providers and also staff will not be affected. Thank you. Question: What's your question, Mr. Feng? Uh, because uh, the contracts will expire early next year. I'd like to know whether uh, they can make a decision uh, by the end of this year. Your question has been answered by Secretary. Uh, Secretary, are you willing to give a yes or no reply to Mr. Fung? Well, we have uh, to uh, tackle this problem when the contracts expire. Our intention is to renew the contract first and internally we have uh, to communicate within the government and uh, we deal with uh, this uh, pressing issue first and in the long term we will think about it. Mr. Long Yu Chong, under uh, contract bidding, the uh, consequences, the original service provider may not get his contract again due to uh, for various reasons. So I'd like to ask the Secretary, why do you insist on contract bidding system? Uh, what are the pros and cons of uh, this funding mode? And how, and balancing the pros and cons, why have you decided to go for this funding mode? Secretary, well, uh, starting uh, from 20. Ten, we have a new mode now for contract homes and uh, EHCCS. Well, uh, we have decided to start a time limited contract system. We hope that through contract bidding, there can be more flexible services, and uh, at the same time, we can ensure quality. And we hope that more. Organizations will have the opportunity uh, to pr provide such services so there can be innovation and also a diversity. Now, for contract homes, we have got uh, 24 homes of contracts awarded. For most of them, they got their contracts uh, renewed uh, so long as uh, their quality is ensured. You said that. Two, only two got their contracts uh, extended. That is not true. Now, uh, these two homes decided not to bid again. That has got uh, nothing to do with us. And I would say that the system has been working well. Mr. Le, no, uh, the secretary uh, did not hear me correctly. I said two homes could not renew their contracts. All right, you told us the uh, merits of uh, this funding mode, but what about the demerits? What do you think are the demerits, Secretary? Well, uh, the demerits are, uh, frankly speaking, in the communication process and in my reply, I said that uh, the uh, sector is concerned about service continuity and uh, the elderly uh, persons may find the new uh, operators and carers uh, rather unfamiliar. However, we hope that the services can be provided smoothly, and we attach a lot of significance to aging in place. So we have undertaken to go and see whether these 5,000 uh, service places can uh, be uh, funded under the lump sum grant model. We have undertaken to follow this up. Dr. Lo Wai Kwok, regardless of the f uh, mode of funding, I'd like to know whether there are specific measurable uh, surface indicators. Now, I'm not talking about the uh, content of the surface, but uh, the quality. Will there be any a uh, service system? Will there be any form of certification to uh, ensure quality? Secretary, thank you. Yes, in the contract we have very clear specifications on uh, services, and we have a monitoring system. We have monitoring. Uh, we have a service uh, sh quality assurance. Uh, 
So it's not that uh, the operators can do what they like. So the quality of service is very important. We are very um, serious about this. My question is whether the operators will be required to get certification. Well, all these are recognized as social welfare organizations, not just any other company in the market. They are recognized as social welfare organizations with a, a performance record, and they will tell us the resources, and uh, we will uh, know whether uh, the staff are trained and are qualified. All these will be provided before a contract can be given. Mr. Lowe, I think he doesn't understand me. For uh, there is already a quality management and a certification uh, system. I believe the secretary has heard your request, uh, Mr. Zhang Kuo Chu. Thank you, Chairman. Well, recently, I've done a study on uh, the contract bidding system. I uh, surveyed. Uh, senior and uh, middle uh, management and frontline staff of these operators. Uh, when there is a change of contract, elderly persons have uh, to um, adapt to the new system. For some operators or elderly persons, they may have uh, their respective religions, and a change in service providers create difficulties for them. And uh, for an operator, it has to a bit again after five years. That means it cannot carry out long-term planning. Third, for experienced staff, because of a change in contract, uh, they uh, there may be wastage. So all these are implications. If we change the funding mode from contract bidding to annual subvention, the administration can still uh, review the services every five years, and the operator can be changed. Please come to your question. I'm pleased to hear that the government is going to uh, conduct a study on this uh, possibility. I'd like to know how long uh, the administration is going to take. When can we have the results? Secretary, we need some time to do it. As explained in the welfare services panel, we cannot do it overnight because that would mean a fundamental change in our policy. Still, we understand the aspirations of the sector and we are sincere to make a breakthrough. So we have to wait until uh, we have uh, the um, plan for elderly services, which will be due in two years' time. Now. If we give them a contract renewal of three years, that will mean sufficient time for us to consider the way forward. But I promise to uh, minimize uh, the impact. Uh, we'll ensure that the service recipients will not be affected regarding the concerns of operators. We do understand their concerns. We'll cooperate to provide quality services for the elderly. Question number five, Mr. Wu Chiwai. Thank you, President. It is learned that the number of visitor arrivals in 2013 exceeded 54 million, with mainland visitors accounting for 75 percent of the figure and their arrivals exceeding 40 million. Early this year, some members of the public were dissatisfied that the excessive number of mainland visitors to Hong Kong had seriously impacted on the livelihood of Hong Kong residents, and thus urged the government to implement measures to limit the number of mainland visitors to Hong Kong. The CE said at that time that mainland and overseas visitors coming to Hong Kong could create a a large number of job opportunities for the tourism industry and the grassroots in Hong Kong, and that Hong Kong people should not become conceited before getting rich. Afterwards, an official of the central authorities said that he would ask the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office of the State Council and the China National Tourism Administration to look into Hong Kong's capacity for receiving visitors. Recently, the government raised for discussion the issues of visitors' demand management and the 20% cut in the number of mainland visitors to Hong Kong. In this connection, will government inform this council A whether it has assessed if the viewpoint put forward by the CE that Hong Kong people should not become conceited before getting rich is still applicable at present? If the assessment result indicates that it is still applicable, why the government raised for discussion the issues of visitors' demand management and the 20% cut in the number of mainland visitors. If the assessment result indicates it is not applicable of the justifications for that, 
B. Whether objective consideration or the attitude of the central authorities is currently the primary basis on which the government formulates the relevant policies on the individual visa scheme, IVS. Should it be the former of the importance of the attitude of the central authorities? Should it be the latter the reasons for that? And C. Whether it is assessed if a reduction in the number of same-day mainland visitors to Hong Kong will have less impact on Hong Kong's economy. If the assessment result is in the affirmative, whether the government will discuss with the mainland authorities changing um, the one-year multiple entry IVS endorsements, in other words, um, multiple entry permits currently issued to mainland residents to one trip per day permits, if it will of the deal is not the reasons for that. Secretary, President, as an important pillar of Hong Kong's economy, the tourism industry has all along been bringing about tremendous benefits in creating employment for Hong Kong. The tourism industry accounts for 4.7% of our GDP and offers over 250,000 direct employment opportunities, most of which are jobs for the grassroots level and with relatively lower skill requirements. Nonetheless, Apart from driving the development of various relevant sectors and providing a large number of employment opportunities to growth in visitor arrivals, has also brought some challenges. The community has expressed concerns about the growth in the number of mainland visitors. We also recognize that increase in the number of visitors has exerted pressure on some public facilities and affected the daily lives of individual districts. The SAR government attaches great importance to these views. Therefore, the major recommendations in the assessment report on Hong Kong's capacity to receive tourists completed by the Hong Kong SAR government at the end of last year also proposed enhancing our receiving capacity. We are stepping up our efforts in this regard. Besides, the SAR government has also implemented some demand management measures, including tightening the control of export of powdered formula on the principle of putting Hong Kong people first um, when there was a shortage in the supply of some daily necessities for our, for our community. In September 2012, when the SAR government learned that the mainland would introduce a new policy to allow non-permanent residents of Shenzhen to visit Hong Kong through a multiple entry individual visit endorsement, we reflected the views to the central government, which um, later suspended the policy. The Hong Kong SAR government has been closely monitoring the trend of visitor arrivals. Taking into account the community's continued concerns about Hong Kong's capacity to receive tourists, the CE indicated in April this year that the Hong Kong SAR government was looking into ways to adjust the growth in visitor arrivals and their composition and would announce the outcome as soon as possible upon discussion with the central government and relevant mainland authorities. Our major premise is to ensure the stable and orderly development of the tourism industry and at the same time minimize as far as possible the inconvenience caused by increasing visitor arrivals to local residents with a view to striking a balance between the impact of the tourism industry on Hong Kong's economy and the livelihood of the community. Visitors from all over the world, including mainland visitors, help boost Hong Kong's tourism industry and economic development. The Hong Kong SAR government attaches great importance to the long-term and healthy development of our tourism industry and has been adopting a realistic and pragmatic attitude in handling tourism-related issues. As a responsible government, we indeed have to listen to all views and adopt a balanced approach in addressing the public concerns, protecting the overall interests of the whole community, and tackling the problems arising from the visitor arrivals. In the past year or two, some members of the public requested that the number of mainland visitors be reduced. Some legal members even suggested that the multiple entry individual visit endorsements for permanent residents of Shenzhen be abolished altogether, that the number of visitors under the IVS be reduced substantially. However, in the recent two to three weeks, we began to receive more diverse views suggesting that we should not handle the problems arising from the number of mainland visitors in an across-the-board manner and that various sectors of the community should have more cautious and a serious discussion on this important issue. As mentioned by the CEO on the 27th of May, reducing IVS visitors by 20% was not a specific recommendation. It was meant to stimulate various sectors of the community to give their views on this very important issue of adjusting the number of visitors and their composition. For visitor arrivals, we hope that the community would focus on exploring the extent to which Hong Kong's economy could afford um, in terms of reduction in visitor arrivals. As for the composition of visitors, we have to consider very carefully the target of adjustment, the type of visitors, and the related economic benefits. Over the past period um, of time, we uh, received more, uh, more and more views suggesting that we should work on the multiple entry um, individual visit endorsement, and uh, some suggested making adjustments to set a limit at one trip per day. 
But then, according to the statistics provided by the Immigration Department, out of the cumulative total number of mainland visitors traveling on the multiple entry individual visit endorsements in the first five months from November 2013 to March 2014, over 96% came to Hong Kong just once a day. And the remaining, about 3%, came to Hong Kong two times or more a day. Hence, we consider that a proposed one trip per day um, is not an effective means to reduce visitor arrivals. As I've mentioned, in considering the two issues of visitor arrivals and their composition, we must at the same time analyze objectively the impact of the adjustment measures on Hong Kong's overall economy. In other words, we need to understand the cost to be borne by the overall community upon the implementation of the adjustment measures. The key issue is the extent to which our overall community is able and willing to bear the economic costs arising from the adjustment measures. Taking the visitor arrivals in 2013 as a reference, out of the 40.75 million mainland visitors, about 42% were overnight visitors, while 58% were same-day visitors. The average per capita spending by these two types of visitors during their stay in Hong Kong was $8,937 and $2,721, respectively. The average per capita spending by overnight IBS visitors from places outside Guangdong province even reached $14,311. Different adjustment measures will lead to different extent of reduction in visitor flow in different districts and different sectors, as well as bring about different economic impacts, including reduction in the number of employment opportunities. The outbound travel policy for mainland visitors, including their visits to Hong Kong, falls within the remit of the central government. We encourage various sectors of the community to seize the time to have extensive and serious discussions and give specific recommendations. The Hong Kong SAR government will relay different views, including views expressed in the past two to three weeks, to the central government comprehensively so that the adjustment measures eventually implemented by the central government would better reflect the long-term and overall interests of Hong Kong. Thank you, President. Mr. Wu Chui, thank you, President. According to the administration's reply, um, stepping uh, one trip per day will not be helpful, and so it shouldn't be done. And then it is said that um, if multiple entry permits are tightened, there will be uh, some impact on the economy. And so we have to wait for the central authorities uh, to make a, uh, give a reply. Two days ago, uh, Macau decided that from the 1st of July onwards, um, for those on, in, on transit uh, from Macau, they could stay for, they will only be able to stay for five days instead of seven days. And yet, we in Hong Kong still haven't got a solution to solve the problems caused to society by the IVS. We keep discussing and discussing, but we still haven't arrived at solutions. Why is it that Macau doesn't need to wait for a decision uh, by the central authorities to solve its own problem? Why is it that uh, tourism policies which are within um, the um, um, limit of our autonomy um, uh, are not decided by us? Why is it that we are handicapping our own um, autonomy? Yes, thank you. Uh, President, I wish to point out that uh, concerning the member's reference to scrapping one trip per day permits, uh, this is not the policy at the moment, so there is no question of um, scrapping such a policy. But then the SAR government would like to actively or proactively encourage different sectors in society to air their views on uh, the, um, visitor arrivals and their composition. We are willing to communicate with different sectors, and we will be prepared to provide objective data and figures uh, in relation to our economy and our capacity to receive tourists so that society can have a more focused discussion and understanding on the matter and so that a solution can be uh, arrived at which can um, strike a balance uh, among different factors. Mr. Wu Chi Wai um, referred to the uh, multiple entry individual visit endorsements. And I want to say that the power to uh, issue endorsements um, is um, based in uh, our constitution. Article 22.4 of the basic law um, um, states that for entry into the SAR, people from other parts of China must apply for approval. And in fact, the NPCSC in 1999 gave an interpretation um, concerning um, the need for mainland uh, residents um, to apply for approval um, to come to Hong Kong, uh, irrespective of um, the purpose of um, their visits. 
and um, permits to enter Hong Kong will be um, um, issued as appropriate. So during this period, the SAR government would like to effectively collect Hong Kong people's views on visitor arrivals and their composition will reflect these views to the central authorities so that the central authorities can come up with a decision which can better meet the long-term and overall interests of Hong Kong. Uh, Mr. Chen Chi-Chun, I've got a question. I want to have a quorum count.
智慧議員，你示範一個問題。誒，跟進一。Yes, I wish to follow up, President. I would like to refer to the last paragraph of the secretary's reply, and the secretary、uh, mentioned、um, the central government. I want to know whether the S A L government, or whether the S A L government, can come up with a policy, and then the central government can try to um, um, work in tandem、um, with the S A L government. What is your question? I want to know whether the S A L Government has proactively、um, put forward policies on the IVS so that the central government can、um, uh, tie in with our policy and work in tandem with Hong Kong. Secretary, we haven't、uh, made a decision yet. Uh, um, during this period, we'd like to hear the views of members of the public on um, um, the number of arrivals and also the composition, and then we will reflect、um, these views to the central authorities, and the central authorities will make a decision. Miss Claudia Mo. No,、oh, I、uh, felt very surprised,、uh, President, when I read the、um, main reply. It was said that in the past two to、uh, three weeks, divergent views emerged, and so、um, I, I think.、Um, um, and it is said that、uh, some legal members even、um, suggested. Um, the、uh, multiple entry permits. Now,、um, in fact, um, uh, the same points were repeated last week. But then, my name and Mr. Gary Fan's name、uh, were mentioned.、Uh, please ask your question. I and Mr. Gary Fan have commissioned a survey、um, on Hong Kong people's、um, views about IVS. Sixty percent felt that the number of arrivals、uh, should be reduced. About thirty percent said that、um, the number of arrivals under the IVS should be Halved、um, in、uh, under West Down to the two o nine level, and sixty percent, in fact, felt that the multiple entry permits system should be scrapped altogether. I want to know how the administration is going to respond to these、uh, views、um, of the public. Secretary, I thank Ms. Mo for her question. President, in fact, the SAR government and the Hong Kong public. Uh, want Hong Kong to remain a premier tourist destination. We want to give tourists、um, a very delightful、um, experience during this stay. Then, concerning the um, some um, of the drastic actions, for example, um, people um, towing the suitcases、um, in the tourist、um, districts, we don't think such drastic actions are helpful. And、um, in the past two to three weeks,、uh, views were expressed. Concerning、um, the impact、uh, on the economy, if the number of arrivals under the IVS was reduced, we all know、um, the economic situation. Now, I am talking about public opinion, and he is、um, talking about the government's opinion.、Um, Secretary,、um, can you please answer Ms. Mo's question as to whether the government is going to respond to views of the public as reflected in the、um, survey commissioned by her?、Uh, yes,、um, President. Thank you. I just want to point out the importance of tourism to Hong. Hong Kong and its economy, and we are aware of、um, the results of opinion surveys、uh, on the IVS. We welcome.、Um, Views and suggestions from all sectors in the community. These views and suggestions will be forwarded to the central government for its consideration. Ms. Mo has referred to、um, the results of、um, a survey, and.、Um, Yes, I、um, have noted the、uh, views of the respondents on the、um, number of visitors、uh, under the IVS. But then, apart from、uh, being concerned about the number, we are also concerned about the composition of、um, the tourists coming under the IVS. And we also have to take into account factors like impact on the economy and also people's livelihood. But then, the survey. Uh, uh, hasn't um, asked um, uh, the respondents uh, about um, their perception of、uh, a reduction in the number of arrivals on the economy. So we need to listen to views from all sectors, and then these views will be forwarded to the central government.、Um, President, I I wish to protest.、Uh, he keeps repeating himself.、Um, thank you, Mr. Kenneth Lung,、uh, President. I do not. Agree that 4.7 percent of the GDP is very important. 250,000 people、uh, means only 4.7 percent.
I want to say that in fact the costs are very high. I want to know uh, that concerning the four point seven percent of our GDP, is it that we have only been relying on um, sales and purchases? And not um, other types of economic development. Secretary, four point seven percent of our GDP. Uh, in fact, I was referring to the tourism industry, accounting for four point seven percent of our GDP. This is an important um, part. Uh, uh, three point nine percent comes from um, in uh, inbound visitors, and then zero point eight percent from outbound travel. And uh, the tourism industry employs over two hundred and fifty thousand people. Um, so uh, we, these are very important data, and we uh, must not overlook the importance of the tourism industry. But then, President, I want to ask the Secretary whether he has considered um, economic transformation. So it seems that he is complacent with the 4.7 percent and the 250,000 job opportunities, and that was. Uh, that is why I keep reminding members that members should not um, raise multi-barreled questions. There should only be one point um, or one main point in the follow-up question. So can you repeat your question? President, has the Secretary um, considered uh, leading Hong Kong down the road of economic transformation? I hope that he, uh, he will not keep talking about tourism industry accounting for 4.7% of our GDP. Um, President, economic transformation. Now, I want to say that today this uh, question is on tourism, so I want to share such data with members. In Hong Kong, we have different industries, and we are developing different types of industries. In fact, in this council, we've said many times that we are moving towards the high value added chain, and we are also going for diversification. Now, for example, uh, we are actively promoting IP trading. We've taken into account Hong Kong's relative advantage in this regard. And I believe members uh, all understand what the four pillar industries are and that we have six um, industries where Hong Kong has a, um, as an advantage. And, but then this question is about tourism, and that's why I'm providing members of data about tourism. Mr. Michael Tian, thank you. The IVS um, has brought a lot of economic benefits to Hong Kong, and uh, a lot of uh, jobs are provided for the grassroots. I do not want, I need to repeat these benefits or advantages. But then Hong Kong people also feel that their daily livelihood is being affected, and uh, if um, the number of arrivals continues to grow at this pace, then we will have 100 million arrivals in 2018, and that will be problematic now because the bridge will be completed, our air will be completed, a number of arrivals will only increase and will not come down. In fact, I have uh, all along said that um, the number of arrivals under the IVS uh, need uh, not be reduced or frozen. But then I think um, there shouldn't be uh, further increases at this pace. And so, um, if we can't set a quota, then can we have? Uh, can we cap the uh, multiple entry permits? Um, uh, I understand out of the twenty-seven million. Now we have. Um, uh, um, in fact, we're talking 27 million arrivals, and we have 1.5 million people. So, can we cap the number of um, uh, visits under the multiple entry permits? Last year, there were 12 million arrivals uh, for those on multiple entry permits. How many of them came to Hong Kong uh, for over 15 times a year? So, can we cap the number of visits per permit at 15 times so that we can? Um, um, Make available more resources to receive the other tourists. So, will you uh, recommend to the central government that we should cap the number of visits under the multiple entry permits? Secretary, Mr. President, now because uh, we have um, seen a substantial growth in the number of arrivals under the IVS, and that is why the SAR government is looking. At uh, the impact of people, the impact on people's livelihood and our economy uh, caused by any adjustment to the number of arrivals under the IVS and, and the composition of the tourists, and we will continue to listen to um, the views of the community. Now, for example, concerning Mr. Michael Tian's uh, suggestion, um, that will be reflected to the central government. For example, should we have um, um, 
um, 15 trips uh, per annum only um, for the multiple entry permits will reflect these views to the central government. Is it that your question has not been answered? Is it that you've already reflected um, the suggestion to cap the number of visits under the multiple entry permits, or is it that you will be reflecting such views to the central government? You, uh, Mr. Tian, you should only point out the part of your question that has not been answered by the secretary. Which part of your question has not been answered? My question, um, President, was whether um, he would reflect to the central government the suggestion to cap the number of um, visits under the multiple entry permits. So uh, yes or no, will you reflect this concern to the central government? Please be seated, uh, Mr. Michael Tian. Uh, President, um, concerning um, uh, feasible um, um, suggestions like the one um, like the one made, uh, made by Mr. Michael Tian, these will also will all be reflected to the central government for its consideration. Last question, Mr. K.K. Fong. Thank you, President. According to Articles 16 and 22 of the Basic Law, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, SAR, shall on its own conduct the administrative affairs of SAR in accordance with the relevant provisions of the Basic Law, and no department of the Central People's Government and the like may interfere in the affairs which SAR administers on its own in accordance with the Basic Law. However, it was reported that some officials of the Liaison Office of the Central People's Government in SAR had approached some members of this council in November last year regarding the vetting and approval of domestic free television program service license applications. In addition, on the 22nd of last month, the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office of the State Council HAMAO issued a statement relating to some members of this council interrupting the speech of and showing objects at the chief executive CE while he was attending CE's question and answer Q&A session held on that day. In the statement, HKMOAO stated that uh, we oppose any behaviour that abuses the rules of procedure, disrupts the SAR government's policy implementation in accordance with the law. In this connection with the government informed this council, A, whether before the aforesaid Q&A session, any member of the SAR government had discussed with the officials of the central authorities on ma any matter relating to the Q&A session and formulated countermeasures, example, preparing a relevant statement in advance or planning to stage a walkout on Mars by the officials, whether Hong Kong Mao had issued an uh, the afford uh, statement at the request of the SAR government B, whether it has studied the scope of the affairs which SAR administers on its own, as provided in Article 22 of the Basic Law, whether there is any mechanism in place at present to prevent CE and the officials of various bureaus from inviting for certain reasons, example, to take advantage of, advantage of the authority of or to pander to the wish of the central authorities. The central authorities to interfere in the affairs which SAR administers on its own and see whether it has assessed in if Hong Kong Mao has contravened the basic law, including the policy of one country, two systems, and the principles of Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong and high degree of autonomy being implemented in Hong Kong, by issuing the aforesaid uh, statement, if the assessment outcome is in the affirmative, whether we express dissatisfaction to the central authorities, whether it has assessed if such an act of Hong Kong Mao has caused the people of Hong Kong to be concerned about the central authorities violating the aforesaid policy. Secretary for Constitution and Mainland Affairs. President, regarding the member's question of the consulting the Office of Chief Executive and relevant departments, the administration's consolidated reply is as follows. According to Article 2012 of the Basic Law, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, HASAR, shall be a local administrative region of the People's Republic of China, which shall enjoy a high degree of autonomy and come directly under the Central People's Co for Government. According to Article 2 of the Basic Law, the National People's Congress authorizes the HKSAR to exercise a high degree of autonomy and enjoy executive, legislative and independent judicial power, including that of fin final adjudication in accordance with the provisions of the Basic Law. According to Article 16 of the Basic Law, the Hong Kong SR shall be vested with executive power. It shall on its own conduct the administrative affairs of the Hong Kong SR in accordance with the relevant provisions of the Basic Law. Since the establishment of the Hong Kong SAR, the central government has been acting in a strict accordance with the fundamental principles and policies of one country, two systems, Hong Kong people administering Hong Kong in a high degree of autonomy as well as the provisions of the basic law to support the chief executive and the HKSAR government in administering, in administering Hong Kong in accordance with law. When the Premier of the State Council, Lee Kertiao, met the CE on the 17th of December 2013 during the latter's visit to Beijing to report on the work of the SAR, Premier Lee reiterated the both stance and support of the central government towards the SAR. 
At the same time, according to the provisions of the basic law, such as those in Chapter 2 on relationship between the central authorities and the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, the central government has the power or responsibility in respect of certain Hong Kong affairs. The central government has established the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office of the State Council as an administrative office of the State Council to handle Hong Kong and Macau affairs and is responsible for implementing the One Country, Two Systems principle and related directives of the central government, as well as communicating with the Hong Kong SAR government. Since the reunification, the central government government and its departments. The offices set up by the Central People's Government in the SAR and the SAR government are all along required to adhere strictly to the one country, two systems principle and provisions of the basic law and abide by their own areas of responsibility in accordance with law. Similarly, the Hong Kong SAR government has also been administering the affairs of Hong Kong, including the issues in question in strict accordance with the one country, two systems principle and the basic law. The members question mentioned the CE's question and answer session in the Legislative Council. I wish to take this opportunity to reiterate the government's stance. The SAR government respects the electrical and attaches importance to our working relationship with the electrical. However, a few electrical members have for years been using vulgar and abusive language targeted at government officials attending electrical meetings and even threw objects at them within a short distance, showing no respect at all for the electrical and the officials concerned and causing disruption to the conduct of the meetings. The SAR government takes a serious view on the unruly behaviours of these members. Any further tolerance will not only compromise the solemn status of the electrical but also tarnish Hong Kong's international image and seriously disrupt the orderly conduct of electrical businesses and even damage the relationship between the executive and the legislature and resulting in failure to live up to the public's expectation towards the electrical. Not only do we strive for electrical democracy, we also call for electrical guided by civilized values. Thank you. Mr. Frederick Fung. Mr. President, I'm angry when I read this reply. I asked, uh, there are three parts to my question, but the uh, Secretary ignores uh, three parts of my question. He just reads out um, a large paragraph of the basic law, again, as if we do not know the basic law. He has not responded at all to the two incidents I mentioned in my question. So is it the case that um, the administration is now uh, taking advantage of the authority of Beijing to prop up uh, CY Leung? Or is it uh, like what um, um, a previous C said, if I don't mention something, then it's no longer there. That means if you ask about one country, two systems, and Hong Kong people in Hong Kong, um, if he doesn't answer the question, that means it doesn't exist. Well, let's give the Secretary some time to reflect on the reply to this question. I call for a quorum.
Mr. Frederick Fong, do you have a supplemental question? President, I asked my supplemental question, but uh, the reply has not been given. Can you please repeat your supplemental question? Repeat my question? Your supplemental question. Now, I'm, I'm angry when I... Re please repeat your question. I am repeating the question. Just now you made a statement. You didn't ask a question. Now, my question is whether the administration would like to take uh, help make... Um, uh, take advantage of the Beijing government to support CY Leung, or is it like what the pre a previous chief executive did? If he didn't say something, then it would uh, just have vanish. Because in his reply, he did not answer my the two incidents I referred to in my rep uh, question about um, Hong Kong people who rule in Hong Kong and one country, two systems. He didn't mention that in his reply. Does it mean that uh, these no longer exist? Secretary, well, um, when there was a quorum call, I took the opportunity to re to reflect on uh, Mr. Frederick Fung's question. Uh, he asked about two incidents in the early part of his uh, reply. He asked about the uh, domestic free TV program service license case in November last year. On the 22nd of November last year at the council meeting, the uh, Mr. Albert Ho asked a relevant question and on that occasion, on behalf of the SAO government, I gave um, full reply to members on the case and to the relevant question. And that's uh, already fully reflected in the Hansard of the council meeting. I'm not going to repeat those points. The other case, that is a statement issued by the Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office. In my reply, I already refer to one country, two systems, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong and a high degree of autonomy and the uh, terms of, uh, of reference of the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office. I already gave such information in my main reply. Now, in the um, Hong Kong Mao's uh, press release, there's mention um, of the State Council of uh, the CE and SAR government officials discharging the duties at LegCo uh, uh, said that um, they should be respected in LegCo. I don't know why Mr. Frederick Fung mentioned this in his uh, question. He uh, did mention this in his question, but actually this is the crux of the matter. The chief executive is elected, is selected by election in Hong Kong and he's appointed by the central authorities. Principal officials in uh, attending meetings at this council, including um, the chief secretary and others, they are also appointed by the central authorities in accordance with the basic law. The central authorities, in this case, of course, refers to the state office too. And uh, here we are talking about um, principal officials coming to this council uh, to discharge our duties and um, they sh should be respected. And that is the view of the Hong Kong Macau and Affairs Office. It's given its view on this matter. I believe that's appropriate. And it's also in line with the um, work of the Hong Kong Macau and Affairs Office. Thank you. Dr. En Chan, recently it has, uh, the um, white paper published and then Mr. Frederick Fung asked about Article 16 of the Basic Law in his main question. So we can see in the community, the way people in, um, interpret the Basic Law, it seems that um, there's a difference among different people. And people may look at the, the two documents uh, from different perspectives. So Secretary, would you consider doing this, that is uh, for areas of basic law where people consider to uh, have a problem, maybe they could all sit down together with experts to explore these parts of the basic law. So this will allow Hong Kong people to better understand the spirit of the basic law, and there should be also extensive promotion of the basic law to every university, to uh, secondary school and primary school. Basic law should become a compulsory subject. Thank you. Secretary, we will actively consider Dr. N. Chen's uh, suggestion. After the reunification in the initial stage, 
the work of the SL government focused mostly on the unique aspects of the two systems when promoting the basic law. Um, for example, in the basic uh, in the SAR, we have our own passport, and then uh, SAR residents enjoy various um, rights and um, freedoms in uh, chapters three and six of the basic law. Now, so the f publicity focused on those aspects. In recent years, there's been a more discussion about uh, between about the relationship between the mainland and um, Hong Kong and many have put forward their invaluable comments. The Chief Executive also chairs, uh, the Chief, Chief Secretary for Administration also chairs a basic law steering uh, promotion committee, and there are many um, non-official members on the committee. Now, on uh, the views uh, we have uh, heard over this period, including the suggestion just made by Dr. N. Chen, I will certainly take for, um, refer these views to the Committee for Consideration. Now, it's a good thing that uh, people have a better understanding of the basic law, and actually we should try to promote that too, because um, the executive is uh, given off, uh, is authorized by the central authorities uh, under the basic law to discharge its various functions. And it's uh, with a high degree of autonomy that the executive is here to serve the people of Hong Kong. So if uh, the, uh, it's important for the people to have a good understanding of the basic law, otherwise it will make it, uh, it may affect uh, how the executive discharges its functions, and in particular for the um, civil servants, the 180,000 civil servants, uh, they must also learn more about the basic law. I will certainly um, bring back such views to the relevant uh, committee for consideration. Ms. M. Lee Lau, President. The Secretary said in his main reply that uh, the central authorities have always abided uh, strictly with um, one country, two systems, Hong Kong people administering Hong Kong in high degree of autonomy, of autonomy as the fundamental principles and policies. But the, the white paper published last week has um, caused an outrage among a large number of people in Hong Kong. The impression gathers, gathered is as in the it's what uh, stated in the white paper, that is the Beijing authorities want to take over full control of Hong Kong. That means high degree of autonomy will soon vanish. Does the SAL government realize that this has sparked an outcry? Has it um, immediately in four uh, to reported to the uh, central authorities that Hong Kong people are really anxious and angry about this, and would they withdraw the white paper? Uh, should uh, the, have you told the central authorities that they should make it clear that uh, there should be a high degree of autonomy and uh, one con and uh, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong? Now, two Beijing officials no longer coming to Hong Kong. Is it because they realize that they have made a huge mistake? Now, Mr. Fong's question doesn't touch upon the white paper. Next Wednesday, there will be an oral question on the white paper. I'm sure there will be plenty of opportunities to, for me to respond to, to members' questions. But perhaps taking this opportunity, I could uh, make two points in response to Ms. Lau. On the publication of the white paper, it's true, tomorrow we have planned a seminar on the white paper. We've invited two, Beijing, uh, two officials from the mainland to come to Hong Kong to give us a briefing, but unfortunately, because of other engagements, they are not able to make their trip to Hong Kong. Now, our bureau is still waiting, uh, is now exploring with the central authorities as to whether there will be another appropriate date for um, planning another seminar, and we'll announce the details when these are finalized. Ms. Lau said in her question just now that uh, when it comes to a high degree of autonomy, and so on. I think um, she's actually referring to chapter two in the uh, white paper. There's a uh, uh, reference uh, to similar words, wordings, if I recall correctly. But if I may remind members to read the whole p sentence in that paragraph, that's a long sentence actually. Now, what it says there uh, in that long sentence um, is it, just to reiterate that um, the Hong Kong SAR is an inseparable and inalienable part 
of the, the of China. That's why the central authorities have overall jurisdiction over Hong Kong. But it doesn't stop there, that sentence. And then the sentence goes on to explain what is uh, total jurisdiction. There are two parts to total jurisdiction. The first part is that um, under the, the basic law, there are uh, powers that could be exercised directly by the, main, uh, by the central authorities, like appointing the chief executive and principal officials, and also on constitutional development in accordance with annexes one and two to the basic law, um, and so on. So that's where the, the central authorities could exercise powers directly. The second part to total jurisdiction is that um, in accordance with the basic law, and the constitution, the, the delegation of powers to the SAR to exercise a high degree of autonomy, that is independent judicial powers, executive powers, and legislative powers. And then after that sentence, uh, there's another long um, reference to various examples uh, in explaining this um, position. Now, I've uh, studied the white paper over and over a number of times. I see that uh, there's nothing added to or taken from the basic law provisions. Now, since uh, the reunification, we've seen economic growth in Hong Kong, the social condition, uh, um, um, job market situation, and so on. And then there, there were some um, incidents as well, like the SARS epidemic. Now, we can see how the central authorities have um, tried to ensure the long-term stability and um, prosperity of Hong Kong is just a um, re repetition of that position. So I hope you will take time to study the white paper and you refer to the objective facts that are in existence. And uh, also you could consider what's happened in the past, as mentioned in the white paper. Now, in the past week, um, there's um, been some discussion, say, about the judiciary. The Secretary for Justice also um, made prompt clarification of certain positions. And if you have questions on uh, any of the chapter of the white paper, we could still have a calm discussion about it. Now, I noted their views to say, uh, is it the case that because now there's the white paper, there won't be universal suffrage? But actually, um, in the white paper, there's only a short reference to universal suffrage, shorter than the that uh, as mentioned in the um, government's consultation document, it just says that it's a solemn pledge that there will be universal universal suffrage in Hong Kong. Also, uh, in another part of the white paper, that's uh, mentioned that uh, the central authorities are committed to um, pr promoting universal suffrage in Hong Kong. But of course, when there is another opportunity, I would like to have more detailed exchange with you. Now, I. I don't know, I have to read the English version to get a correct interpretation of the white paper. Can you come to your question, please? Now, I want asked whether you have told the central authorities that this white paper is a serious mistake, it stirred up huge trouble, and our Hong Kong people are most anxious and angry that there will no longer be one country, two systems, a high degree of autonomy. Well, that's uh, Ms. Lau's statement. What, Secretary, please, your reply. Well, I believe uh, Ms. Lau's statement is just her, uh, an expression of her own feelings. Now, in Hong Kong, there's a high degree of transparency. There is a round-the-clock uh, live uh, news. So I'm sure the, the central authorities are fully aware of the, what's going on here in Hong Kong. Mr. Tem Yu Chung, the central authorities have um, stated repeatedly that uh, it supports the SL government uh, to govern Hong Kong in accordance with the basic law and the, the, the law. So if the sea is attacked, um, central authorities' uh, body expresses concern uh, that body is in charge of Hong Kong affairs. So what's so wrong about it? What's, uh, uh, what's your view, Secretary? Secretary, well, I mentioned that the chief executive is the head of the executive in accordance with basic law. He is also the head of the Hong Kong SAR. So in accordance with the basic law, the chief executive is to enforce the basic law. And on behalf of the executive, he can um, send government, uh, SAR government officials to come to LegCo to answer questions 
and uh, be so on. Now, when the basic law was um, passed, uh, Mr. Uh, Director Ji Pang Fei, when he described the relationship between executive and legislature, he said that um, the two should work together and there should be check and balance uh, between the two. And uh, if you, you may, uh, uh, if you allow me to say this, I think there should be mutual respect as well. So when it comes to the constitutional order, um, the CEE is appointed by the state office, uh, state council, and then. Um, if there's something that happens here, that is where the CE is given due respect in this council, the state council makes a statement, and I believe that's appropriate. Mr. Mlang Singh, on the last paragraph of the reply, can I ask the secretary this? If uh, this council is to take certain actions to restore the um, normal operation in this council, Is there a need to enhance the rules of procedure so we could keep up with the times? Do you have any suggestion on how, what action that could, should be taken to preserve the dignity of the electrical and government officials? Well, if I may remind members, the rules of procedure are to be uh, formulated by this council in accordance with the basic law. Secretary. Yeah, Mr. President, you pointed out correctly that uh, under Article 75 of the Basic Law, the rules of procedure should be formulated by the Legislative Council. But of course, it must not uh, be against the; it must not uh, contravene the Basic Law. Now, um, when a lot happens in this uh, Council, the Chief Secretary for Administration has written repeatedly to you, President, to put forward our position. But then, in accordance with the basic law, of course, the rules of procedure shall be made by the council on its own. Now, we would like, um, uh, and we have um, a high expectation of this council enforcing the rules of procedure. We have an extraordinarily long session of oral questions today. It's come to an end now. Bill, first reading, copyright amendment bill 2014. Bill